We're going to have two presenters today. Uh, the first one uh, presenting on the digital deadline race, upgrading the uh, classroom AV cabling will be uh, Mr. Tom Beggs. Uh, Tom has been working in the higher education AV support and development for 21 years. He joined CCUMC in 1997 and attended his first conference in 1998 which he describes as two of the best things I've ever done for my career. His activities in CCUMC have included a couple of panels, a presentation at annual conferences, as well as serving as a member of the board of directors and past chair of uh, emerging technologies. Second pre presenter will be uh, on the analog to digital conversion. 350 rooms in four years, and I'm keenly interested in this because I'm in the midst of uh, embarking on this myself with about the same number of classrooms, so this is, uh, this is a great session for me to be moderating. Uh, since 1999, Carl has served as Academic Technology Manager for Hillsborough Community College. Uh, he is responsible for academic technology system design, installation, and repair in over 350 classrooms and labs. From 1990 to 98, he was Learning Resource Coordinator for Hillsborough Community College, where he was responsible for the district AV budget for equipment, repair, and supplies for all the campuses. And from 1988 to 90, he was senior AV technician in the AV services department at the University of South Florida, where he was responsible for a $30,000 operating budget and over $500,000 worth of equipment. He planned, coordinated, and dis uh, the, planned and coordinated the distribution of all the AV equipment throughout the university. And from 1985 to 97, he was the NCOIC manager of an AV center with 1,500 man intelligence center. He was responsible for the overall planning, organizing, managing, and controlling of graphics, photography, reproduction, the conference center, and TV production. And in 81 to 84, Carl was uh, operations sergeant and master instructor, responsible for the planning, coordination, and management of the administrative office uh, as well as classroom uh, activities. He instructed junior and senior sergeants in TV production, graphic and uh, graphics and photography and leadership skills. And uh, in, from 78 to 80, he was a training material writer and prepared correspondence courses for photographer and photo lab specialist jobs and prepared a plan of instruction for the NCO advanced course. So. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn this over to Tom and um, take it away. Thanks very much for uh, coming this afternoon. Uh, I know it's uh, Saturday afternoon and your favorite team may be playing like mine is about right now, close to it. I've, uh, I've been at the University of Georgia for uh, 10 years, but uh, as uh, folks who know me, uh, uh, I'm actually doing penance by working at Georgia because my grandfather went there, my father went there, my brother went there, and I did not. So I had to work there to kind of make up for it. In the 21 years I've been in higher education, I've seen a lot of changes. The first six years, uh, starting in 1991, uh, I saw overhead projectors, overhead projectors with LCD panels, we finally started buying some uh, LCD projectors that we actually checked out and delivered. I also saw the changes from going from delivering everything to installing everything. And of course, that also meant that I saw 16 millimeter to VHS to DVD and on. So I've seen a lot, but the last three years have really been a, a major change for us. And uh, that's what, of course, what I'm gonna talk about today. But you know, there was about a dozen years when things didn't change a whole lot. For about a dozen years, our standard was 1024 by 768. We pulled VGA cables and we pulled composite cables, and that was it. You know, it, it really almost lulled us into a, it'll be this way forever. Well, my, uh, my premise today is, is really uh, quite simple. Uh, in a couple of years, we're going to have nothing but digital signals out there. The, the solution seems pretty simple, right? We're going to pull a digital cable. And uh, is the process evolution, revolution, or panic? 
Today I'm going to talk about the history of the digital transition at the University of Georgia. I'm going to talk about the technology models that we're using now and how they're changing. I'm going to talk about the plan that we have in place to try and achieve this transition and the procedures that we're going to take to, uh, to accomplish it. You know, every time I look into my crystal ball, and I think I use this on every presentation, I realize that I, I miss something. Uh, you know, I, I used to say that our transition to widescreens at the university was going to be when, when Microsoft PowerPoint adopted widescreen. No, I was, I was really wrong on that one. But I think what is pushing it is commercial, I mean, is uh, uh, the uh, uh, consumer AV. That's really what's pushing the widescreen. And um, of course, the transition from, from VGA to digital, for us, we've been talking about it a long time. And we thought, oh, we'll, we'll always have VGA. At some point, you know, commercial AV will finally decide to do something. And uh, you know, we've, we've got DVI and HDMI and DisplayPort, and they didn't standardize. And we wondered what in the world was going to happen. And then last year, AMD and Intel announced that they were going to no longer support VGA. Well, we knew it was coming, but, but we really thought it was going to take longer. A little history at the University of Georgia. Uh, I arrived there in uh, 2003. And we knew that widescreen was on the horizon. Is this too loud? Or does it just seem loud to me? Uh, the, the audio's OK. Uh, we thought that widescreen was going to be on the horizon. Why was this? We were opening up our student learning center. And we had a consultant, Waveguide. In fact, my, my rep was actually Scott Walker at that time. Believe it or not, he actually came out to schools and talked to us. And, and he designed that building with 16 by 9 screens and with widescreen projectors. Needless to say, we were really ahead of the curve on that. Because we didn't get widescreen projectors for like another five years. And, but what he had done made us really start thinking about it a lot. Now, we did go back and change out some of those 16 by 9s to 4 by 3s for a while. And of course, now we're going back and changing them back again. But, uh, but it certainly, uh, we, we began to realize that we were going to have to start thinking uh, over the next few years how we were going to accomplish uh, and be prepared for this digital transition. Well, we call 2006 the year of the screen. We had debated it, we had talked about it, and we finally decided that we were going to start installing widescreen. So we spec'd and installed 16 by 9 because that was going to be the format, right? Well, then, of course, the manufacturers started going, well, maybe not. It could be, could be 16 by 10. But we knew that this was going to be a long-term infrastructure investment. You know, you put up screens, how long are they up there? 10, 12 years. Well, we wanted the screens to be in place. However, in, uh, finally in uh, uh, 2007, uh, my rep from Epson, we had standardized on Epson, finally told me it was, we were going to be 16 by 10. So, of course, then we changed to start installing 16 by 10s for the next few years. And uh, the funny thing was, in 2007, when the conference was at, the CCMC conference was in Florida, I was on a panel where we talked about wide formats. So we've been talking about this for, uh, for a long time. Um, you know, big expensive projectors had been around a while, uh, you know, but a reasonably priced uh, uh, 1280 by 800 projector that, that was easy to hang, no. Now, we had been installing some uh, uh, Panasonics, and we'd installed some digital projection and film and art rooms because they needed it. But it was finally about eight months after Epson finally told us that we started uh, that we got what we really wanted, which was the Epson 5200. And um, it was a reasonably priced projector that we could roll out to all of our classrooms. And then, of course, all of us learned a whole lot more about EDID than we ever thought we would know, right? Because we were living in a world of 4x3 and widescreen. And if we didn't have, wide, even if we had widescreen monitors in a classroom, 
you know, then we had something like dual projectors and suddenly it was like, it wasn't that the computer and the projector couldn't talk to each, uh, forgot to talk to each other, they just didn't know how to talk to each other with these wide formats. Well, you know, digital cabling's been around a while. HDMI actually just celebrated its 10th anniversary. Uh, this is not a newcomer to the, to the scene. And of course, DVI's been around longer than that. It's been hanging around on the backs of projectors and, uh, and uh, computers for a long time. And except for connecting to monitors, uh, we pretty much ignored it. You know, it, it wasn't gonna do anything for us. Um, however, of course, in the, in the consumer market, HDMI is starting to gain traction because what's not, like, what's not to like about a single cable that gives you audio and video and it's one cable unlike those days when we had four or five RCA cables and all. So, um, you know, we also had Macs that were quickly moving to digital and uh, I even had during this time uh, a department that said, we want you to install this 45-foot HDMI to um, DVI cable uh, that cost us $700 because they were convinced that it was going to be the, the right transport method. And so I installed it, and sure, it was a lot easier than, uh, than pulling component cables. Um, and meanwhile, we, of course, still waited on commercial AV to, to make a decision on what they were going to standardize on. In 2009, we also installed our very first, what we called a parallel system. Uh, we had seen our first laptops walk in with HDMI. We knew that was, uh, you know, that was a sign, you know, we should start getting prepared for it. So we, um, in some of the rooms that we were renovating, we would put an HDMI cable in the cable cubby, and then we would use a twisted pair solution from there up to the projector, and our control system was merely uh, was merely switching inputs on the projector because we weren't quite ready to spend a lot of money on a big expensive switcher at that time. Now the, the parallel systems are nothing new. A lot of y'all probably did them too. In fact, I heard uh, uh, Bruce mention the other day he had done some parallel systems. Uh, and it was a start and we knew it was going to come. So some of us started pulling Cat6 in every new installation we did and don't we look like geniuses now? Yeah, if, you know, because we've got some of these systems we've done, anyway, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So we, we've been prepared for that. Now, finally in, in 2010, we finally uh, got a glimpse of uh, the digital future for us. Uh, X, uh, Extron rolled out its, uh, its first hybrid switcher, the 409. We realized that it was a cost-effective way for us to add digital along with the analog. Uh, we were using it in smaller rooms at the time and it was, uh, we also used a big heavy HDMI cable that my uh, friend at uh, Extron, uh, Tim Schnabel, called a hose pipe because it's so big. And uh, using their HDMI 101, uh, we were able to send 1080 signals to the projector and oh yeah, our tethers were about this big, but hey, we, we had digital in the classroom. Of course, then came what I now call the first analog sunset. With the exception of existing models, any license player, blah, 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 y'all have all seen it, you know about it. What was it about? I went around saying for a long time here, I was wrong again, it's the end of composite. Well, it was the end of composite, but that's not what it was really all about. It was really all about because the, uh, it gave, it, with digital, in Blu-ray, it gave control over the content owners, and let's be honest, we're talking Hollywood movies here, and this is really all about the consumer business again, that we had a, um, that, that they're taking control of these, of these ports, and um, it really was a foreshadowing. I didn't realize it at the time, but it, it was a foreshadowing of what we were gonna see in the very near future. Well, I'm getting closer to this year. 2011, that was our split, per, what I call our split personality summer. Projects that we had been costing out and buying equipment for in late 2010 before the release of the 409 were analog. 
But then once they released the 409, we started specking and installing the 409 model. And uh, so that summer, we were starting to, we, we installed both types of, uh, of systems. And you know, we were feeling pretty good about it because you know, we're starting to run digital cables from our document cameras and uh, putting uh, uh, you know, HDMI in our cable cubbies. And we installed some 12 digital systems in 2011. And we really felt like we were moving forward towards a digital future. And even in, simple, uh, even in simple system rooms where all we were doing was putting up a projector and uh, uh, putting up a wall plate, we were also putting an HDMI wall plate, so we were giving them a digital capability. Of course, we did run into some problems. The first time we had tried to integrate a video conference system into it, we are trying to use digital along with that, suddenly we have blue screens. And we're going, what's going on here? And we realized that those digital keys that are being exchanged are not being exchanged like we need them to be exchanged. So, we had to wait on, again, commercial AV to be able to come up with some DAs and switches and all that would easily handle all of this. Later uh, last summer, we also made the decision to go with the MediaLink 608 switcher. Uh, it was a switcher that we could use in our large lecture halls, had a lot of capability, especially with audio, but of course, one of the key components of it is that it uses, and if you're using the analog side of it as well, three cat sixes directly from the switch to the projector. It's a whole lot easier pull. In fact, we would uh, hire our EITS group, which is Enterprise Information Technology Group, as a cabling group, and they would come in, and they would pull all the cat six and certify it and color code it for us. And, you know, if you pull cable like I do, you know, the bane of your existence is large lecture halls, right? And suddenly we don't have to pull cable in large lecture halls. Uh, we, th we thought this was, this was wonderful. But then last year came the second analog sunset. And the second analog sunset, of course, was what I mentioned before, where uh, AMD and Intel suddenly said, okay, we're going to cut the uh, analog apron strings and no more VGA. Now for consumers and small businesses, this is not a big deal. But for those of us in education with hundreds of classrooms, it's a real big deal. You know, the thought of having, in just a very short period of time, to have faculty coming in with digital connections and we don't have those digital connections. Well, UGA has, uh, and I'll talk more about this in a little bit, about 475 classrooms. We've got 12 systems ready at the, uh, at the announcement. That's about 2%. Oh, shoot. Yeah, this is a pro this is a problem. You know, we, we don't have very much out there. Well, before I talk more about 2012, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, about the models that we have uh, at the University of Georgia. Now, I'd already mentioned our simple model, and and this happens with departments that don't have a lot of money. Usually, it's in small conference rooms where they really don't want a cabinet. They just want to be able to hook into a projector. We put a wall plate that has the usual VGA composite, and then we'll put a wall plate with HDMI. All the audio goes to the projector. We take an output from the audio output from the projector, put a small lamp above the ceiling, a couple of ceiling speakers, and they've got a pretty decent little simple system. And of course, I, I, I do need to mention that, of course, uh, even though I don't mention it in our standard models, um, we're specking nothing but, and haven't for the last two years, nothing but uh, WXGA and WUXGA projectors. Um, so uh, this, is our, uh, this is our 409 model. As you see, we're an AMX shop and have been for ever. And um, I have, uh, we have our own AMX programmer who is, who is super sharp on this stuff. Um, I feel like I need to mention that not only, of course, the, the core of the system is the, the 409, and you see that we've got a, a Wolf Vision VZ3 and Wolf Vision VZ8, and of course, as of this fall, both of those are going to be power over Ethernet. This could be a whole other presentation about a change in the future. Our touch panels are PoE, 
as well. And uh, not only is, are we using our, in our document cameras, cameras we're doing uh, DVI to HDMI and our Mac minis and uh, our, um, our local PCs are uh, DVI to HDMI and then we've got a Blu-ray player. All of a sudden this summer, and I wire cabinets just like my engineers do, and all of a sudden I had this epiphany. We have gone from total analog two years ago to total digital now. That all of our system, that that these system designs are, are total uh, digital. And I was, also I want to mention, especially since Scott Walker mentioned it yesterday in the presentation, that we also use power distribution units in all of our cabinets so that we control what goes on and off when we turn the systems on and off and that amps are turned off when they're not in use and so that we're trying to be as green as possible with, with these systems. This is our 608 model. Looks very much like the other one uh, except for the, uh, the 608 switcher. I don't know if there's a whole lot I can say about it. Uh, that is probably too small for you to see. Uh, uh, I don't have it on the current uh, presentation that's on the proceedings, but I'm going to update it to include it. This is what we're ending up paying for our, um, this is really bad design, isn't it? Y'all can't read those numbers, I know in the back. But basically our 409 system, the control system part of it, is costing us about $6,400. The 608 system is right at $7,000. There's only about a $600 difference. And of course, we're debating now amongst our engineers whether we even need to do the 409s anymore because there, there are things that the 608 does that the 409 doesn't do and, and we should have some advantages there. Um, I should say with our models, and this has not been true for a dozen years, our model didn't change. You know, it was the MPS 112, the MPS 112, and again. And now we're looking at new technology that's coming out constantly. Uh, I threw this up because at one point this, this was our standard model for doing dual projectors with dual content and we were using two matrix switchers, two matrix switchers, a whole bunch of cabling and um, it wasn't a simple one to, uh, to, to wire up but we're no longer using this because we have some alternatives. And one of those alternatives is the uh, AMX Innova system. Uh, I, and I, I know that you Crestron guys are probably going to go, eh, that's old. But, it, but it's new for us guys at AMX where we've got a combined controller switcher and both of the switchers that I have listed up here are both matrix switchers. One's a 3x6 and the other is a 10x4, I think, or maybe a 10x6. Anyway, the, they're, they have a lot of inputs and outputs. And, um, uh, we can see that this would be a way for us to, to dual do, especially the 2155, to do dual projector pretty simply. And uh, the, the bigger one for a system where we're about to, to work on a system where it's a dual projection and then suddenly one of the faculty member goes, oh, did we tell you we're going to be teaching classes at a distance and we need to integrate video conferencing into this? I was like, okay, so we're about to uh, we're about to start working on our first system with the, the 3155. The advantages of these systems are going to be, and I'm really trying not to make this uh, to sound like a sales pitch for AMX, but for our advantages, we see a lot less cabling in the in the cabinet. But one of the key components is going to be HB, HD base T. Does everybody know about HD? HD base T? No? Oh, you do. Some people do, some people don't. Uh, it, this may be the cabling of the future for us. A lot of companies are adopting it. Uh, Panasonic is. Uh, I know the guys at Extron were showing off their boxes with HD base T. Uh, one Cat 6 or Cat 5 goes 100 meters, um, carries audio, video, control, uh, and power over Ethernet. Uh, as well as signaling with one cable. Talk about a much easier run. So of course we're very much um, interested in it. But as you can see, we've thought about the disadvantages. One of the things is going to be 
you know, with a single box you've got to change out. In the old days, oh, I had support specialists who were not CTS who could change out a switcher, and the controller was fine. But with, uh, with the Innova systems, of course, with it all combined into one, somebody's got to drop code into that when it goes into a, into a classroom. So I'm actually sending a couple of my support specialists to, to uh, AMX school to, uh, to learn how to do at least dropping coding into, into these boxes. And of course, the spares are expensive. Uh, here's another comparison chart that you're not going to be able to read from the back. but let me say the, the, the dual switcher the dual switcher model was about 11,000. The uh, 3155, which is the 10 by 4, um, it's right at 12,000. And uh, the uh, 2155, the one on the end over there, which is the 6 by 3, is about 10,000. So it's actually less than what we were paying for the dual projector uh, the old dual projector mo uh, model. All right, back to, uh, back to the present. At the University of Georgia, we have somewhere between 475, 500 classrooms, somewhere around in there. And my group, the Center for Teaching and Learning Classroom Support Group, owns about 100 of these classrooms. That's about 20% of the classrooms on campus. These are the classrooms that were developed by my predecessor, Steve Gamble, who is also a longtime CCUMC member. Um, he got end of year money, and he installed these classrooms, these early classrooms. And um, he was a lone voice crying in the wilderness because, you know, most of the time department said, you're doing what? That's expensive. Why are you doing that? You know, and he kept doing it. We kept installing. And then, as I mentioned before, we opened our, our student learning center in 2003. And uh, those 30 classrooms really kick-started uh, a desire to have technology in the classrooms. I really did have faculty and departments that would call me and go, we want technology in the bioscience building in this room, and it needs to be just like the student learning center, or as it's now known, the, the Miller Learning Center. And so it, it became the new standard. And uh, we didn't have money, enough money, to do all of their classrooms as fast as they wanted us to. So fortunately for them, Student Tech Fee came along that allowed them to be able to pour money into classrooms. So what they would do is they would call us, we would go out, we would evaluate, we would work with them, develop a design for the room, give them a price, they would get funding, then they would come back, and they would hire us to install it. In fact, my group became its own little integration company for the, for the last nine years. Well, in 2003, we had about 30% of the classrooms uh, on campus had technology. There were some other, that other 10% were some early adopters in the law school and in our Terry College of Business. Now, we're running somewhere between 97, 98% of all of our classrooms have technology in them. And unfortunately, most of them are analog. So after this summer's installations, we have somewhere around 46 classrooms or so, 46, 50 classrooms. So now we're up to 10% of our classrooms have digital technology. Still not quite there. But we have a plan moving forward, fortunately. Our largest college, our Franklin College of Arts and Sciences, uh, they had decided a couple of years ago that they wanted to, how shall I say, uh, take the decision making away from the departments. The departments were cheap. They would look at the price of a control system and go, ah, just hang me a projector. You know, just pull me some cables. Uh, do a simple switch, do something like that. Well, Franklin decided that they wanted all of their classrooms to be on the standard touch panel model. So they started putting money into it. They started telling departments, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. So starting last year, they were, they were the one, to one group that we installed most of our, our digital rooms for. Um, so we have a plan there. They're on a multi-year plan to upgrade all their classrooms. And of course, most of them are going to be digital. 
The Terry College of Business, another one of our large colleges, has always been progressive with their technology and they're in a round of upgrades right now and so all their classrooms are moving towards digital. My group also had a, had a good news, bad news situation. Uh, the good news was this tech fee committee decided to give us $300,000. The bad news is I have to spend it this year. And, you know, if you do your own installations, you know, normally we only, well, anyway, it's going to be a challenge. Well, it's phase one of a three-year plan to upgrade all the classrooms. And one of the things that I did was I worked out a plan that we should be able to accomplish this. And I'll, I'll talk about this in just a minute. So by this time next year, we hope to install about another 18 to 20 percent of all of our classrooms, uh, or of the, the mass majority of the classrooms. So now we'll have about 35 to 40 percent of our classrooms will have digital with a couple of years to go. Now, how are we going to do this? Since my group does most of the installations with four engineers and three support spe specialists, you may wonder, how in the hell are they going to do this? Well, the real question is, how have we been doing it for the last few years? Because remember I said we've gone from 30% to 98% in the last nine years? Well, especially since I've had no new staff since 2003, until today I got an email right before I came down finding out that I'd gotten another staff member, which was really good news. Good way to go into a presentation, right, to find out you got another staff member coming. And, uh, but what, it, what we've been doing over the last nine years is that we've been upgrading our skills. When I first got there, our engineers did not have any certifications. The two engineers now have our CTSD, two of my support specialists are CTS, and um, that's, that's only been part of it. We've upgraded our skills. But another good thing is that we have a local AV company that we have a really good relationship with. They've been doing all of our new construction and our major building renovations, and they build everything according to our standard. So when we take it over, it's the same equipment, it's the same everything, so we can, we can support it easily. The other good thing about it is we have a temporary labor agreement with this company, and that means that in the summer, in uh, May and June, I can go to them and say, you know, uh, I need a couple of, CTS technicians to, to join my staff. And so for, for six to eight weeks, I get a couple of CTSs who come and work on my staff just like they're on my staff. They pull cable, they wire cabinets, they do all this sort of thing. And um, that's how we've been doing it for the last few years to be able to have some extra people. Uh, another thing that we've been doing is uh, developing swing classrooms with our campus reservations group so that we can move classes and uh, in and out. Uh, and um, uh, Franklin College has also set aside some storage areas where we can not only store equipment, but we can go in and wire cabinets and prep things and get them ready to go. Another good thing about our, our process is with our facilities management or physical plant group, they have a, a, a group within physical plant that does nothing but classroom renovations. Well, we've been working closely with them over the years and they begin to realize it looked real good to all of, for all of us if they would come in and follow certain standards all the time. They put up our projector brackets for us, they put in power for us, uh, they build chases for us to run all of our cables, and when, it's, when the, it's a room that they're renovating, they also buy the screen and install it, and all this is at no charge to the department. So that it's a, you know, it's a real advantage when I know a year out what they're going to planning to work on the next year, I can go to the department and say, physical plant's going to come in and do these rooms, let's work on funding so that you can also upgrade them. Some other good news is that we have a wonderful support group on campus called EdTech support specialists from all across campus from different colleges and departments and, and our group. Uh, it was a grassroots, efforts, grassroots effort 
that was formed by them so they could get together and discuss problems that they're having, not just with classrooms, but with uh, you know, classroom management systems, clickers, class capture, anything like that. So this has been a, a great platform for us to meet with regularly and talk to them about what is changing in the, the AV world because these are classrooms that are in their areas that, that we're changing. Now, the, um, oh, another piece of good news is we're about to open another campus. I keep talking about all this extra work and it's good news, right? Uh, the, uh, the, this new campus, though, uh, with all the renovations, of course, everything is going in digital there. So, in conclusion, we definitely have some challenges. And the two challenges, of course, are planning and funding. And uh, fortunately, we've been doing a lot of planning over the last couple of years, uh, sharing information, and departments have realized that, that we have an issue. And as far as funding, our, our Student Tech Fee Committee and our CIO uh, have bought into this process. Uh, he has already advertised at a meet. I was so happy to see this. I'm at a meeting, and he's talking about state of EITS, and one of the things he advertises is that we're going to support phase two and phase three of what my group is doing with classrooms. And they've also made a commitment to supporting the colleges as well. So we've been evolving towards digital over the past decade. And uh, it's been evolution. Now it's revolution. And I'm trying not to panic. Now, thank you. I finally got a laugh there. Um, one last thing, because I, I did tease this in my, uh, 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 in my prospectus, but uh, will digital cabling change? You know, the basic format's probably not. Everything I've read says uh, they pretty much settled on DVI, which was the standard, and then the supersets of uh, DisplayPort and HDMI. You know, probably the bigger thing is going to be HD base T. And, um, and if you didn't think about it before, you know, think about the implications for for uh, digital signage that that would have. I know Bruce and I have talked about this already, that that means you can have digital signage with one cable and no power, no getting physical plant to come in and put power there. And the other thing is BYOD, or if you're in K-12, it's BYOT, bring your own technology, or in the case of some of us, we'd rather it be BYOB. But um, that's a whole other presentation. And I know that we've got the, the webinar coming up on it. And there, I've heard about a lot of different solutions, the possibilities. But certainly, that is going to be a major thing that we're going to have to deal with. So that's it for me. And I appreciate your coming this afternoon. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try and answer. Yes, sir. Talk a, a, a bit about the, the different HDMI's, HDMI point one, point two, point three, uh, and how your interfaces and the new now one point four and one point four A. Um, does your HDMI, you're, you're much right. more technical than I am. Oh, oh uh, that's a good question. I, I not not in my scope. I leave that to my engineers. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Carl.
How about now? Yeah, hey, there we go. Good afternoon. I'm Carl Swibens from Hillsborough Community College. And I'm going to be talking about our plan to go from analog to digital in the 350 rooms that we have. So, let me see if this clicker works. Okay. I'll give you a little bit of background on, on how we started. Um, we got started in 2006 with 60 rooms. And what happened is the president decided to give us some money to go ahead and do classrooms. It was about like $350,000. So of course, when that happened, we were under IT at that time. The Office of uh, Academic Affairs decided, well, you're talking about putting stuff in classrooms and that's a big chunk of money, so we need you guys to move under us and we'll take over the money. So that's exactly what happened. Of course, then that meant we need to have a committee. Uh, we need to get professors and everybody involved. And so what they did is they played around for almost nine months, went out to different locations, and we looked at different um, systems and different places in Florida. They also said that, well, we don't want it to just be technology. We want it to be classrooms furniture and things like that because we had students sitting in them chairs that you have in grade school or high school and so they said well you know we want to do the whole room we want to paint the front wall as an accent wall and all so they did that stuff but I still had my money all they told me was kind of what they wanted they wanted a projector they wanted some type of simple control system they wanted a DVD VCR and a computer in the classroom so I said, okay, and that's what we went for. They didn't tell me what kind of, you know, go Extron or AMX or Crestron or whatever. So that was an advantage there. Is, of course, they had no idea what those names were anyway. So we started out, did that, and uh, we're, it's getting close to the end of the fiscal year, and the college president tells this uh, vice president of academic affairs, you know, you got two months, and if you don't use that money up, I'm taking it from you. So then all of a sudden, it was a big rush, you know, and I was trying to rush them along anyway, but then it was a big rush to go ahead and decide, get vendors, get quotes, all that other good stuff, and then have these 60 rooms all installed before the fall term. So that was, that was a lot of fun. But we used three different companies, so we kind of could gauge which one would do the best job for us. We'd, AVI, which is only AVI at the time, um, Southern Business, which is now Xerox or something like that. I, they keep changing their name, and CCS. So those are the three we got. I was familiar with AVI, so I gave them the bulk of the work, and I gave CCS and the other companies the rest of the stuff so that we could determine then who would, for the next three years, get the rest of the projects that we were going to be doing. So we started out with 60 rooms. We used the MLC 104 with a DVCM, so you didn't have no remotes in the classroom. We had the MPS 112 switcher. We put in a PC, a laptop, uh, VGA for the laptop. Uh, we didn't put a laptop in there, just a VGA, and a DVD VCR. And then as we were going along in the process, somebody said, well, you know, let's put document cameras in some of the classrooms. This was after we had already gotten this information. Well, it, uh, an MLC 104 only has four buttons on it. So if you count PC, laptop, DVD, VCR, what was the, oh, document camera, there must be one other thing I'm missing. But anyway, oh, the DVD, VCR is DVD, VCR, two buttons for that, which then control the, the touch panel. So we were missing, if we started putting um, document cameras in, we had to do something else. And so what we did is we took the, the 104 and the PC was also a laptop, it was a toggle. Confusing at first, but that, that's the way we had to do it because they were already in the purchasing plan. So that's what we came up with. Um, in 2007 then we figured out they said, well, we want document cameras in all the rooms, so, and go back and put them in all the ones we didn't put them in, too. 
So we had to do that same process then for the following year. And we switched to MLC 226. So that's our standard now, the MLC 226 with the uh, MPS 112. Uh, we currently have 360 rooms. I'm adding, I think, eight more this year. And those eight more that I'm adding, of course, are going to be digital. This was the 112. For us, other people had suggested certain things, but this did exactly what we wanted, and it was like $480. So to get a switch that would do what we wanted for that price, everybody else's was $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 for a switch. But it has VGA, video, S-video, and then all the audio inputs to it. We started the digital transformation. I must have skipped this slide. There we go. Started our digital transformation in 2011 and 12. We started with um, 10 new rooms and we picked the Extron MLS 608, which is what um, Tom was talking about also. I didn't pick that. I asked for a quote from AVISPL and that's what they recommended was the 608. That's of course they also suggested that in his price was $2,400. If you add an amplifier to it, it's like $2,600 instead. So that's a, the sales guys let me know that this is your best bet for right now. Even though he had the 104s, uh, not the 104s, but the 409s available, that's what he said we should go with. So we went and did that. We added HDMI to the AAP for a future laptop connection. Uh, we have Blu-ray players. Actually, we bought Blu-ray DVD, uh, Blu-ray VCR combos because, like everybody else, it, we still got a ton of people using VCRs. And then we switched to BG, uh, WXGA projectors with an HDMI uh, input on them. So we were buying new projectors with the HDMI on it. So the 608 which is here, has four analog inputs and then four digital inputs, which are HDMI. So, and you could also take and put, uh, if you had a DVD VCR combo, you could use one of those analog inputs and run the video through that instead of, because it doesn't have any like composite video on it, but you could run it through there. So this is what we ended up buying with the 226. And it's the same deal where you, you run two uh, cat fives up into the ceiling and uh, the receiver resides in the ceiling and that takes care of everything. It had the amplifier, the whole works in it, which worked out pretty good. But the price to me seemed a little bit high for that. So in our conversion process where we already had equipment in there, we decided to go with something different. The... Uh, 608s come with uh, with or without the amp, like I said before. They have DSP Pro or Pro DSP in there, which he's talking about if you've got a big auditorium, microphones and all that stuff, it's kind of handy to have. I have a regular classroom, 30 people in it, so I really didn't need the DSP Pro part of it. Even though we have it, we're not really utilizing it in those 10 rooms that I was talking about before. It's got um, three... We had three analog VGA inputs that we used. You got four HDMI, two line microphones. Now we do use a microphone in case we have a professor that has laryngitis or whatever, so we could pop a microphone in there. This one had two, the uh, 409 only has one. Oh, going the wrong. And I had already covered that. It's got how many inputs it has. We, we put the PC, had it DVI to HDMI. The document camera, DVI to HDMI. Uh, the Blu-ray went into HDMI input three. The extra laptop for future use was in the, uh, input four, and then the analog laptop was in the VGA one. So when we come up with this, the first time where we're going to put it, then that's what we have our installers do that exact same thing every single time. 
so that they don't decide, oh, well, I'm just going to put them here and there and there. So if something goes wrong with the PC, you know that it's going to be an input number one. You can pull it out and put it back in and test it like that. So we keep that standard, and we did the same thing with the, uh, the 112s, the ML, MPS 112s, MLS 112s, MPS. This was our controller that we had here. It's a 226. So we got used, now we're using all six inputs where we were using five before, and we just add laptop one as the uh, DB, uh, HDMI input for the laptop. In, in this particular case, then, too, we also added, we had, fortunately, you had one slot left in our uh, control panel um, accessory plate. And so we put the HDMI in there. Now, with the 608, it has de-embedding the audio. So you can put your HDMI from a laptop in there. It'll de-embed the audio and send it out the program. In the 409, it doesn't do that. So the 409 actually has, has to have a separate input to it. In, uh, when, when I decided to, to do the classrooms, the new classrooms, uh, or the old classrooms and do the conversion, I looked at the, the plate and figured, how am I going to get audio down to the 409? So I, got, I called Crestron up and I said, look, I'm going to buy 92 409s this year and a couple hundred more. What can you do for me so that I can have an audio input on the VGA plate? So they says, okay, we'll make it for you. So they came up with a part number. Now I have an HDMI with a 3.5 audio, and there's a part number for that is 70 dash 10 dash, I mean, 1017 dash 02, costs 70 bucks. It's an extra 20 bucks to have that. On the back of the, um, uh, 409, I'll show you that in a minute. It, it has four inputs on the HDMI audio inputs, a 3.5 audio. So that's how you're getting your laptop audio uh, coming out. On buying computers, we were buying computers with VGA because that's what we had. So it, it's kind of confusing right now because when I go to do the conversion, I don't know whether the computer has VGA or whether it's, it's digital, you know. So I'm pretty sure that the last couple of years I've been buying them DVI, D, or DVI-I, so we can just put an adapter on it and it'll work either way we want to do it. Even if it doesn't have that and it's strictly VGA, the 409 then will put the VGA input into the 409 and just use that until we get a new computer that has a DVI D output on it and take that through uh, the DVI on the 409. So that's one thing also that you have to think about that I didn't before when it comes time to buying computers. When we buy computers in, my, in the lectern replacements, I'm the one who picked what computer we would buy and what kind of output. And I always made sure it had VGA in it. And in this particular case, now I should have been a little bit, uh, had a little bit more forethought and say, well, maybe I should get with a DVI-I output because then I can use it for either one of them. So we're converting the existing rooms using the MPS 409. It's the exact same rack size and everything as the uh, 112s that we had. This is what it looks like. So we have two VGA inputs. We have two DVI inputs. It's got three HDMI inputs and then one output. It has uh, two composite videos on it and uh, one microphone input that has phantom power on it also. So we're going to take that and uh, if you put this um, in combined mode, there's some real simple process of putting this uh, switcher in the combined mode. It will take the DVI and the HDMI and send them all out HDMI. So then what we're going to do is, in that replacement process, when we 
put the switches in, I thought it was smarter to just leave everything. We already have VGA cables, we already have composite cables, we already have audio and everything going up. Well, it's going to the switcher, I mean the amplifier. So why bother changing all that stuff out? We can just swap it over at an HDMI cable and boom, now we got digital input into the projector. So we're buying new projectors, of course, that have that input to it. So like it says here, we can keep all the existing equipment. We don't have to replace cables. We don't have to buy Blu-ray players and go digital with all that stuff. We can just leave everything like it is. Put that switcher in and that's all we got to do is run the HDMI cable, change out how the different inputs go into it, like the document camera and the um, uh, computer will both go into the DVI and then we have our extra input for um, the laptop, which will have the uh, HDMI and the 3.5 on it up on the desktop. And then if we end up at a point where the VZ, DVD VCR dies, we just pull that out and then we just use another input on, and use it on HDMI because it's got plenty of three inputs on it. So basically that's the, the setup there, the VGA it's only going to be if somebody brings a laptop in now and wants to use it on VGA mode. But everything else will be digital, except for the DVD, VCR, and the laptop. Okay, we're converting the rooms. We're using Epson PowerLite 915. WXGA with the HDMI input on them. Uh, we had been putting in um, Epson 96Ws. We did that last year. We replaced a whole bunch of projectors and put in new screens. Our 2006 projectors were um, five years old, almost six years old, so we replaced all those, put new screens and new projectors in. And, and we didn't do the the digital conversion, but when we go to do that, it'll have what we need up in the, uh, up in the ceiling other than the cable. Instead of using the 96Ws, the 96W has a, a certain, we're using um, a screen, a 16, 16 by 10 screen, which is, um, I think it's 60 by 96. So ha keeping the same screen all the time, the throw distance, for that 96W is like 10 foot six to 12 foot seven. So it only gives me two foot. So if I have a projector up in the ceiling that's let's say 14 feet away and I go to use that 96W projector, well then I gotta pay, because we pay a company to do all this stuff, I gotta pay them to move the projector back in the back room. So every projector they move, they add on a little bit more money. That projector is about six hundred and fifty dollars. The nine fifteen is about eight hundred and fifty dollars, give or take. But it has a throw range from eleven foot to eighteen foot. So that's another thing that you got to think about when you're doing that change out. If you're doing it yourself and you don't care, then it makes doesn't make any difference. But if you've got to pay somebody to be moving projectors, you want to make sure you get a projector that'll fit better in that range so that you can pop it up into the same spot and it fills the screen okay and you don't have to move the projector. So we're doing 92 rooms this year. It's going to be completed by hopefully January of 2013. Uh, we hired AVISPL to do our installation and they're going to start we don't have, most of our rooms are pretty well booked up, but we don't have school on Fridays. So they're going to come in on Fridays, and then the Christmas break we have like a month. So they're going to hire another subcontractor to come in with them, and they're going to do all the rest of that during the Christmas break. Hopefully I don't have to be around to supervise them, but <laughs> I gave them my cell phone number, so I said, you know, if you need it, if you need it call me. Uh, we had a, a slight problem, too, with 
some of the rooms that we were doing had MLC 104s in it, and so we're going digital. Now we get the same problem as we added another HDMI input. So we had to figure out how we were going to do that, and what we're doing is the first button is going to be for the PC, the second button will be for the document camera, the third button will be a toggle between the two laptops, so it's just going to say laptop on it, but we put, put instructions in the room for them to know that if you're on red, you're on VGA, if you're on green, you're on uh, HDMI. So we have to toggle that one switch until we can buy a 226, but that's another expense that we'll, we'll bear wait later on down the line. And then the last button is just going to be video because all we're sending is video. We're not doing, we used to do S video and, and we basically couldn't tell a difference. We popped a couple different um, uh, DVDs in, used SVHS and used regular composite and, and you really couldn't tell a difference at that distance. So we said to heck with it, we'll just use, use composite video for both. Of course, if we replace it with an HDMI, then you're going to get good stuff all the way around. Some of the ways that we are able to fund this is, and we had a similar thing like him, is, is the student fees, they throw them into this, um, uh, it's called CIF, uh, Capital Improvement Fund. So the students pay for this. So we've been able to get money all along to do this kind of stuff. And then for the digital, my old boss, like two years ago, I asked him, hey, should we start going widescreen and putting in widescreen? Nah, nah, we don't need to do that stuff. So now I have a new boss, and I said, hey, you know, <laughs> now we really know that there's an end to this, you know, analog time in 2015. So should we start doing that? And of course, his answer immediately was yes. You know, start swapping them out and, and uh, change the projectors and then start getting digital switches and stuff. So the way we're starting this is this year, there's the rooms we put in in 2006, last year we changed all the projectors and screens already. So we didn't feel it an effective um, thing to start with the 2006 rooms. 2007 rooms that we did were, was probably about 80 or so, 80 or 90. They need new projectors and new screens. So it's more cost effective to get the installation company to change the projector, change the screen, and change the switcher at the same time. So that's how I'm working it is, is if it needs a new projector and a screen, it's getting a new switch also. So that when they come out to the room, they come out to the room once and do all that stuff, and then you don't have to worry about it. Instead of, of course, in the 2006 case, they're going to be coming out just to put switchers in in those days, but that's going to be down the road probably another four years. So our plan is then in the second through the fifth year, or fourth year, by 2015, is to go ahead and replace all the projectors and all the screens that are analog and end up with, by December or January, whatever, January 1st of 2015, we'll have replaced everything. So we'll be ready when somebody comes in, <coughs> excuse me, with a digital laptop and says, this is what I want to use. And we go, okay, there it is, plug it in. And we won't have to then go through some kind of fix to try to figure out how to get that form. Somewhere in this plan, too, I'm going to try to figure out how to get the money to convert the uh, 104s to 226s. But the first, like, 90 of them were done with 104s. So buying that, plus the box is a different size, and the AAP plates are a different size, so it's going to cost a little bit of money to do that. And I'll do it, I might do that only when the thing goes bad, replace it with a new one. You know, if it's still working and they're okay with the toggle, then I'll go ahead and leave it like that. Of course, by 2000. 17, I'll be retired and I won't really have to worry about it. Somebody else will be in there talking about it. Um, we have one campus that we have uh, 17 rooms and they're all Crestron MPS 100s. So I got a hold of Crestron and said, give me a solution for it. 
Now, what's their solution? The $4,800 DM300. And I said, well, you know, I could rip your thing out, buy a 226, buy a 104, get it programmed and everything, and it would cost less than that. So can you come up with some other solution that your MPS 100 will work? Because all I really need is a digital signal being fed up to the projector when I swap the projectors out. And, and this I'm going to do next year, so sometime in the next seven or eight months, I've got to figure out how to do that. You know, because those things were, I think, two or three thousand, maybe twenty-five hundred, three thousand dollars. This was one of the. It's a brand new campus at South Shore. They wanted to go green. They wanted to have the ability to do whatever. And so my boss said, "Well, I'll use the Crestron stuff, you know, because the Extron's limited, and they didn't have the panels." I think a year later they come out with the touch panels on the Extron. But it was kind of late because I already had put in all the Crestron stuff. <clears throat> so if anybody has any ideas on that, I'll show you my information. You can give me, a, uh, send me an email, let me know. Are there any questions on what I was talking about so far? Oh, well, this is the end anyway. Any questions? Yes. HDMI and HDCP compliant and EDID compliant, a and then you get fingerprinting. And um, we've had some problems with some Kramer DAs in particular, mm -hmm. uh, being rated as being EDID and HDCP compliant, but not really. Uh -huh. Anybody else? Any questions? Well, if not, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl and Tom. Appreciate that. Looks like that. you get to break early. <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks very much, everybody. about right on 20 minutes. <laughs>